Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for being, being here. This is our November 2023 Building Committee uh, meeting. And um, I'm going to be turning it over to Helen and Matt in a moment. I just want to, again, yet again, thank all of you for your service and your input. Uh, obviously, it's been a journey. Uh, and, and the journey is still going on. So with that said, I do want to thank you again, Helen and Matt, for all of your work. Behind the scenes, and again, taking feedback and trying to figure out how we make this work in the budget that we have. So, I know it hasn't been totally positive meetings over the last few weeks, but here we are. So, without further ado, Helen and Matt. Sure, without further ado. <laughs> All right, we can advance this slide. Um, so, uh, I know we were missing a number of you last meeting, um, so please feel free to ask questions if, if we're, we skipped a step for you. Um, but where we left off last time was pursuing a, um, a path that would get us closer to the money that the school has in hand for this project. Um, so today we're going to review the changes that we made um, to get the cost down. We um, did get an updated cost estimate from uh, Ann Fogarty, our estimator, and then of course talk about the next steps. So as a reminder, the program that we have developed um, was for 10,000, a little over 10,000 square foot building. Um, we were able to uh, cut square footage by eliminating classroom, pet house, and the greenhouse. <clears throat> Always within mind, allowing space on the site to, to for future development of those elements. Um, had to move away from CLT um, as, as an option due to the cost. Um, our pursuit of air source here system given its lowest cost after evaluating a number of systems, and we are um, keeping with the DDB or design big build delivery methodology. So again, that's just an updated floor plan. Uh, hopefully, should we get the, the go ahead to move into DDB, we will um, meet again with, with Andy and James. Mark and um, make sure all the spaces are where they want to be. And I just want to point out to the committee, uh, so while we are at this point proposing cutting it back to the 7900 square feet, eliminating the classroom, with eliminating the head house, uh, the thought process is to save on the demolition cost of the existing facility. Um, so if we keep the, the existing facility, at least for the time being, until we have those funds, uh, we have the classroom, we have the head house, and we have the greenhouse. So it's not that we're necessarily cutting that out of the program. It's simply we'd be having two different facilities for the time being. And as Helen said, as you see in the diagram here, uh, you know, when somebody does hit Powerball, and we have the money for the expansion, uh, hopefully we can do a re relatively easy, in quotation marks, expansion, uh, so all of that can be within that, that point of the building. So I just want to put that out there that we're not cutting things out of the schedule. We just divide. Um, I, I wasn't in the. I wasn't able to attend the last meeting, but I wanted to share some thoughts. Um, the the plan is to continue to use the existing greenhouse, the existing classroom, and the associated facilities that are that are persistent. Those facilities do not meet code. And that is, in my opinion, unacceptable to have children in a building that doesn't meet code. So there's no cost accounted for here to bring those buildings up to code. I'm also wanting to voice my disappointment that this new building is a significant departure from what was initially described as an inspirational building to, to reboot the forestry horticulture program. And so it is just, it, you get what you get for what you pay. And to cut $5 million <coughs> off a budget, you're going to get a $5 million less valuable building. I would like to propose, and, or at least hear the answer for why we're not using the $7 million budget to rebuild the 3,000 square feet that burned. To me, you can build a beautiful, inspirational replacement for the part that burned, that has no demo. It doesn't change the flow of the campus, but it's not gonna flow differently anyway, because that building's going to remain. So we're not gonna have that loop road. It's not gonna be an introduction to the back of the campus. So why are we retaining something that doesn't meet code, that needs significant repairs, 
in building a steel shed nearby that has one and a half million dollars worth of site work. That doesn't make sense to me. I think that one and a half million dollars should be spent on the existing building to idealize that, to use natural fibers, to use innovative building techniques, to inspire the next generation of students. We have seven million dollars of public money to work with. It is just unacceptable to me that we're not rebuilding the 3,000 missing square feet for seven million dollars. Imagine that is a 3,000 square foot home for seven million dollars. If we can't get it done for seven million dollars, we need to do a gut check. That's ridiculous. Jonathan, out of all the respect, we have six million dollars. Second of all, um, I have asked that question, um, and there is a, a laundry list. I'm, I'm sure when we get to it, you know, Matt and you know, I can do a much better job than I can to, to explain. Because uh, my mind was there, you know, with you, Jonathan, as far as it, why aren't we simply people? There has to be a, a good explanation to that. And I think there are some very rational explanations to that, which I think would be. Uh, I would just I, ask Ellen and Matt to kind of go through the presentation. I but, think that, that's a question that has to be discussed. But I feel like we're getting too far down the rabbit hole of getting sold on another building that we just heard months of presentations without really a very good assessment of pricing. I would be incredibly frustrated if this was my money. Oh, it is my money. We're talking about $1.1 million worth of site work that doesn't need to happen if we rebuild on the existing footprint. $1.1 million. This is school. We're already pinching pennies. We're using old books. We're talking about if we hit the Powerball. Is that really how we budget our families? If we hit the Powerball, that'll never happen. It doesn't happen. We went through the feasibility study, John, and there's about a $7.4 million project to rebuild on the existing footprint, and I did not include the site work that has to happen. Fair, 7.4 million. We just got Not a budget of 12 million for the new building that got suddenly a $5 million haircut. John, that was never the budget. I think that's where you, I think that's, <coughs> to say that that was the budget, I think is, is misleading to anybody who's watching this or is in the room. That was the proposed cost. Our budget has been $6 million. The, the budget is always, the available funds budget has always been the six million twenty six thousand that we have. To, that was the proposed cost. So I don't I just want to for anybody that's watching this or is gonna watch it, you're making it sound as if there was twelve million dollars, now we're gonna cut twelve million, we're gonna save it or it's somewhere else. It never existed. No, nope. and I just want to. Yes, it never existed. It, absolutely. So we're always going on six to seven million dollars, and yet okay, SMA just, came back with a twelve I, million dollar. Where were we? I hear. This is not I their first rodeo. The passion, and I hear what you're saying, but let's at least be factual and not misleading, because you accuse everybody of being misleading on several occasions around here. And I just let, let's be fair. That was not the budget, so please don't turn it down. So We're doing the best we can. Perhaps you're not hearing me clearly. The budget has oh, always been six, clear, six to seven million dollars has always been the budget. And so where did SMMA lose vision on that? Because they were selling a bill of goods. There's this beautiful building with natural materials that came back at 12 million dollars. You, John, we have all put out there our own ideas and wish lists and best best case scenario. Mm -hmm. So they priced best case scenario, which is what we asked them. And I think that's what they did. I, I, How, do you disagree on that? Yeah, I mean, I were do. you putting yep. best case scenario I, out there? Were you putting wish list items out there? Were you putting visionary things out there? Yes, we were. The, the reality of the cost came back. I just want to be clear for anybody that watches this in the future and is in the room, I just, I find what you're saying to be very misleading. I, I feel like we've been in the same meetings here and the budget has always been clear. And yet the experts in the room who built these things, this is not their first rodeo, finally gave us a price and it was twice what we could afford. And okay. so what we're being offered here what is tantamount to a steel, like airplane hangar. <coughs> this is not, not to be inspirational. Okay. 
are you there? Are you expressing like disappointment that we all might be feeling? Are you expressing um, that now we have to deal with the reality of the situation, the money that we have available? Or are you, it sounds to me like, I don't know, it feels like it's coming from somewhere else or it's something different. This, this, it's, it's, it, this situation that we're in is the situation we're in, and we have to figure out how to move forward. Absolutely, with, okay, where we are. So, so I'll clarify. My feelings are deep disappointment. I feel like that I have been misled by SMA okay. because I feel like they are the experts on this. They should have known what the price per square foot should have been all along, and when we we consolidated the building smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and yet it was still twice the budget. That feels like a dereliction of duty. With public money, that we spend good money on SMMA. And I'm not impressed with this, this product, work product here. This is a barn that students are going to be in. This is not inspiring the next generation of horticulturalists and, 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 and arborists. When we, we can, we have to renovate and make code compliant the existing space that's there already and the missing 3,000 square feet surely can get rebuilt for that six million dollars just I find that to be incredibly unacceptable this is a lot of public money mm -hmm. and this isn't the deliverable this is not the inspirational so uh, Jonathan I don't want to cut you off but I think we do have a presentation and there are many other members around the table who Fine. I think I have some valid input. I just want to make sure that everybody has a voice. I find hearing your concerns loud and clear. I, I hear what your suggestion is loud and clear. I'd recommend that we get to the presentation and we open it up for a conversation. Okay. Uh, as far as as a whole committee and I as one. That's my recommendation. I'd like to make a comment. Um, I agree with uh, Principal Joe in regards to we gave our design team a wish list, a vision, and they incorporate that into the design not knowing of course not knowing the cost at the time until it had enough development to go to the estimators to give us a real cost so in my opinion they did their job and they did what we asked them to okay let's move on okay um so uh, we need to go back to our cost estimator at the reduced square footage. Um, and it's, you know, it's difficult to read here, but you should be able to. All of you should have packets in front of you yep. as well. It might be easier to still refer to your packet to see the numbers. So the process was to ask uh, AM Fogarty to price a reduced square footage option. This still is for the CLT. The way we have handled um, evaluating options as with the last estimate we received is via alternatives. So once we saw that there was no clear way to get to the CLT building, um, we looked at the reduction of the square footage and we introduced the topic of a consideration of a prefab metal. Um, so that's what the latest list of alternates number one is um, going to that prefab metal option. We, do have, we did also ask our estimators for, for some additional information on electrical, given we are needing to keep building E going. Um, and some of those things will still need to be investigated. Again, should we continue into DV? Um, we did ask for a cost for student labor, student with guidance from staff labor for a few of the trades in a small section of the building. And that's uh, reflected here as an alternate. And then finally, alternate number five, um, Mr. Barry had asked me to we look at uh, a wood frame building. So um, those were the latest um, data points that we received from um, Poverty, and we got this, I think, late last week or early this, this week. Maybe just to clarify for folks on that alternate number five, when we say a standard wood frame building, that's, that's light wood two by members in terms of the construction, probably some prefabricated trusses, not too dissimilar from the companion animal building that's getting built in the case. And that was part of the concept also was to try to look for a very cost effective model that's getting built on campus right now and to see what savings that would offer us um, in lieu of the prefab building just as an alternative. Go ahead. 
And then along with that, this latest round of estimation, um, we asked for Purchase Design Group to comb through costs once again, um, you know, really take a fine tooth comb through it. Um, Lucy and Rachel were able to identify some additional savings. Um, that's the 159, 636, uh, the bottom right. Um, and again, so when we proceed, um, there are additional things that can be explored once we um, really get into the design and the stormwater management issues with reduce the square footage with an eye to future expansion. So, next. And Matt did his, his work <laughs> with the fine tooth comb to the building um, and again identified some things that he felt um, should be worthy of consideration. Um, Almost far to the right recommended column is, is what we're looking at here, upon which um, the latest we think, overall cost is based. Um, we are still um, looking at the prefab metal as a good option, not only durability wise, but um, slightly quicker from a construction standpoint. Um, and um, I don't know if you want to go through that. People have questions. Yeah, I guess I would leave it a bit. I don't know that it's a, it's a time to go line by line. I'm certainly happy to do that if, if folks are interested. But if there's any items that people have particular questions about, happy to answer. Just, it, I will maybe just frame the entire sort of effort. That some of these um, are really items that we would want the entire committee to buy in in terms of proceeding with it to make a change to make. Um, there are a few of them that just as we're going through the estimate, um, for instance, with the sinks and the three basic. Because the head house has been removed, um, we wouldn't need the three base sink because that was intended for potting activities within the head house. Um, and then I think somehow classroom sinks made it into the estimate as well. And that was never the intent to have sinks in terms of the drafting classroom or anything like that. So some of them are just easy items that can get removed, and others would there need to be some discussion there. And then in summary, <clears throat> again, this is our take on, on the latest estimate, you know, um, subtracting out uh, the recommended column from a site and building standpoint um, and putting back on, you know, the design contingency escalation um, costs associated with, with where we are in the schematic design. Uh, and that yields us a construction cost at 5.4 million. Of course, we do have soft costs on top of that, um, which um, Craig has um, revised um, based on you know, latest information at 1.3. So the total project cost at this moment is looking to be 6.78 million. To clarify, in that soft cost are contingencies for the owner. So there's a 5% overall contingency and a 1% contingency of soft cost rolled into the soft cost numbers shown here. And just to talk a little bit about the, the prefab metal building approach. Um, this was something where we didn't necessarily just you know, take the cross laminated timber, mass timber uh, design that we had. We, we engaged one of the manufacturers, actually two different manufacturers, um, in some conversations to understand how can we adapt the design that we had to work better with the prefab metal building technology um, and really to, to get as, as much efficiency out of that system that we could. Um, so the section that you see here on the screen um, is really what we provided to the manufacturers in terms of facilitating the dialogue with them. Um, some of the efficiencies that we gain here is that we're actually clear spanning from one end of the building to the other, so there would be no internal columns. Um, so that lets us save on footings and foundations associated with those internal columns, and it actually frees up the interior layout of the building a little bit um, to allow us to um, move walls, partitions around if needs be as we move forward a little bit easier. Um, we were also still maintaining with them the concept of having the climbing tower available to us with the 35 foot um, clear height within, which is um, the, the dimensional requirement that we have there, um, as well as trying to maintain the clear story um, that's at the top of the shop spaces, um, like natural light down in, and also providing um, that beacon effect um, when you're looking across the field and sort of the approach from the rest of the campus. So. Yes, there is a there is a quantifiable and qualitative change in terms of um, the design of what it is, but we're really trying to still um, find the 
the, the really positive aspects of the design that we had originally, but find a way to incorporate them within the, the language of the prefabricated metal building. So to make sure I understand, the revised estimate of 8.4 million, that was to build the smaller, but what, uh, CLT. Right. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so you're, you're capturing mm -hmm. all of the site work and all of the general conditions, general requirements, blah, 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 all of that in 6.7. So you're going from 8.4 to 6.7, that is your economization to use a metal building. Correct it with the inclusion of the additional DE items that were up on screen, a certain subset of them. Okay. Is, so I see air curtain. Did that capture the radiant floors that were described? Um, I don't think radiant floors were part of the, the basis of design, the most the lowest cost um, HVAC system up there. Just have some additional imagery here to convey the oh, look and feel. Hold on, oh, sorry. Before you move on, sure. um, before I forget, I'd like to get an idea of what general conditions are and general requirements. I think those percentages are high, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to know. The way I look at it, if I incorporate those two, would be what I would call general conditions. And I'm trying to remember when I was in business what our general conditions percentage would be of the bid amount of the project. Um, I'm questioning those percentages. So I, I will say that our estimator did take a look at it between the, the $12 million version that was initially that came back to us and then looking at the smaller building. Uh, they were initially estimating at $120,000 per month. Um, I believe in terms of, I'm going to get them mixed up, I think it's the general requirements in terms of um, what the cost would be on an ongoing basis every month that the construction was going on. The GCs. Yeah. What do we call the GC general condition? Well, I question that value, so. It does seem high, Rick. Well, and we I'd like we're to uh, push look into that. that a little further, and I'll reach out to my networks or something. What feedback I get? And I guess if we, if we get, and that's how we work on, on many of the topics of the estimate, if we get yeah, no, I understand, I understand the process. Yes. I know I missed the meeting, so, um, so maybe it was discussed. The last meeting I was at, I thought we were all in agreement around radiant floor heating. Was there a cost that came back that made it prohibitive on that, or how did that get worked in? I might have missed it. So it, I think it was part of the initial discussion in terms of alternatives. There was the combination kind of discussion of the geothermal feeding the radiant feeding uh, in the flooring. Um, and it was, in terms of the estimating, it was included as one of the alternates um, that was uh, priced out. But it couldn't be achieved separate from the geo, if the geo part of it was... So then we would we need some sort of boiler to fire the the, the hydronics that are going through the room. And what was the price point on the pellet boiler system for that? I don't recall the, that breakout. Okay, so, and you accounted for the fact that the Forest Service was going to pay for half of that? We didn't price that in. Um, I haven't seen the commitment from so the, the Forest the Service. So the $300,000 prices that I gave you two quotes on yep. for similar schools, and the school and the Forest Service was going to pick up half of that. Yep. So $150,000 was the more expensive option? There was there was enough of a cost delta between the base design, which was the I'd like to, Yeah, I'd, I'd really like to see those two because I feel that was very compelling pricing. Yeah, I think we did have the backup for those alternates in the original estimate that was sent around, uh, but we'll confirm that. We were looking for some radiant heat, definitely. Yep. Yeah, when we get to bidding, we can add an alternate. We can talk about that and make sure that that's priced out, so we can we can look at it. Okay. Yeah, I just yeah I was looking at it separate from whatever system fed it. I I thought that the conversation that we had talked about it being um, an efficient option. Uh, so that's why. Okay. And I would say that's true of, of all the 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 efficiency of the system, specifically the geothermal. Um, I think proved out to be more efficient from a traditional 
rather an energy consumption standpoint. But in terms of the first cost dollar impact, yeah, uh, there was a premium there. And again, we're, the, the goal was to get us ourselves down towards the target. It right. was just challenging to accept anything that was going to push. And did you down. account for okay. the 50,000 kilowatt generator in both of those electric options? So no, the generator, that, that's an ad um, yep. that's listed there. But it's not needed for the telephone. Correct. You could yep. um, just count on bringing in additional pellets the same way you would be counting on bringing in additional. Of course, yeah. Right. You have to have a, yep. a, yep. And that was in the $300,000 estimates that I gave you two schools that have those. Mm -hmm. For 300000 minus 50%. Could I say um, uh, thank you for looking into uh, a light wood frame building? I'm surprised that the delta is only about $100,000. And I think it's, it's just worth pointing that out to the committee. I think that the aesthetics and the function uh, and um, the teaching value of a wood frame building um, might uh, might have a, a value greater than $100,000 over a metal frame building. And I don't have anything against a metal frame building, but I'm, I'm surprised when the, when Delta is that narrow. Um, I know there's a lot of experience with, with everybody who's going to bid on this. They're going to have a lot of experience with 5B buildings, uh, which is a light frame building in the code. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if, if that delta is much smaller when we go out to bid. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there are local GCs that that uh, want to do this um, as a feather in their cap, as a favor to the school, um, and, and tighten up their bottom lines as much as possible, and be able to deliver this, <coughs> deliver a light frame building uh, at a similar cost to a metal frame building. So I think that's worth pointing out. Tom, what are you seeing for lead times on light frame material for your projects? Are they challenging or are they... Yeah, they're... Th <laughs> Every project lately has been challenging, uh, it seems like, across the board. But of all the, the building materials, you know, two buys are, are coming. Um, they're not a specialty item. They're not specially manufactured. You know, that's going to happen mostly on site with the exception of the trusses. Uh, but they're just assembling two buys. So I think it could have much less of a scheduled impact than having to have uh, a supplier basically manufacture, I, I don't know, I'm pulling this out, 80% of the building and then deliver it on the truck. So. And this would be what? What would have to be required? Two by six? Two by eight? We'd engineer it as it goes. I imagine it might be two, uh, two by eight square <coughs> walls given the heights of them. But um, our structural engineer will work out those details as we go forward. And just so people understand, in terms of what, because I didn't mention this earlier, the light wood frame represents just to be apples to apples with the prefab metal building. The prefab metal building um, includes both the structure um, as well as the exterior envelope. So the walls um, and the roof. And we have some images to look at in a second just to sort of show you what that is. Um, for the light wood frame building, we'd be talking about um, asphalt shingles in terms of the roofing material, and then fiber cement lap siding board as or, or a different type of siding, um, but fiber cement um, for the exterior. So that would be the envelope. That's what the number represents, and sort of that's what's in the delta there. You calculated anything as far as the carbon footprint on this steel versus the wood? We we did look. Um, initially at the difference in terms of the, the benefit of the bath timber frame um, and certainly the bath timber frame is going to be um, much preferable in terms of carbon footprint in terms of what it represents but we're, we're again we're unfortunately targeting that, that first cost and we know that's that's an unfortunate reality we, we wish that was not the scenario and that we could really examine the trade-offs better and really target something that has a lower carbon footprint overall um, but at the same time, we had to meet the budget as a sort of a primary requirement. And so that's, that was what was driving a lot of the recommendations that you see there. We, we all make those choices. And so you go to the Toyota dealership. Do you buy the electric vehicle or the gas vehicle? We, we're all going to have to make those choices. And yet we make these commitments. The Commonwealth does too. Every 2 by 4 is made of carbon. 
at John, least. John, they're not the deciders, so I feel like you're always sort of yelling for it. at them. Nope. So there's no yelling. And there's no not yelling, the sir. Deci- final deciders. I'm holding okay, I'll us accountable it. because it was a pledge to make the not the volume. I'm sorry you don't like what I'm saying. No, but not, the, no, don't don't twist it. I'm not saying whether I like it or don't like it. I you're you're like telling you're me how I'm saying things, sir, and I'm like clarifying what I'm saying. I feel like you're always... I'm telling you what I feel. Fine, John. I feel like you're always directing at SMMA in a negative connotation and negative tone. They're not the deciders. They're presenting what we ask. Mm-hmm. We can ask them to present more. I know that at times I, I get the impression you feel that what they're presenting is skewed. And I feel what you present is also skewed to what you value and what you look at as. We all are coming at this from different perspectives, we're all intelligent people who have experiences. I want to make sure that everybody at this table feels respected for those differences and can feel comfortable voicing those different perspectives and opinions. I feel a lot of oxygen in the room is taken up by you that makes people stop talking. That's my opinion right now, and I'm speaking for myself. But I want to make sure that everyone feels that they can have an opinion on things and can share their ideas and we're not attacking any one group. At the end of the day, the school and the board of trustees have to make a decision. I think that you do a great job showing other perspectives. You have a valued voice on this committee. I want to make sure everyone else feels that way too because I don't feel that way when I hear how you talk to them. Bottom line is, the bottom line is I, I do agree with Joe. Um, the bottom line is, as the superintendent, I have to be the one to stand in front of the board this evening and, and ask for some direction. Because this fire happened over a year and a half ago, and our students and staff don't have a good in teaching. And at this point, thank you to Joe and thank you to Melanie, we have $6 million. Without those two, we aren't even having this conversation. That's the bottom line. The budget has been six million. I have to stand in front of five trustees this evening and say, how do we move forward? And after the feasibility study, we didn't have any of the conversations that we've had, which has been great at this building committee level, but they've been all wish lists. At the end of the day, we have six million dollars. And I know SMA has been very happy with the six million dollar budget either, uh, which has made some very difficult conversations. Um, and I'm sorry, Jonathan, but that my joke about the Powerball fell on, on, on deaf ears. I, that was a joke. But the point is, I wish we had more money. I wish we had a school structure that would go to a town and say, let's go through MSBA and build the building that we deserve and our students deserve. We don't have that opportunity. But the question is whether, Jonathan, we like what it sounds like or not, we need to have those questions answered. I fully agree. Okay, heard. so if, if there's... The tone of the voice, whatever, but let's get the questions answered anyway. Put them on the table, let's get them answered. Um, you have two board of trustee members here, and and Superintendent Lincoln Hooker has a great point. He's got to stand in front of three other of us tonight at 5 o'clock and pitch this project, and we want to do this project as best we can, but we have limited funds. Do we go to the city for additional funds? That's all going to be part of the conversation with everybody. Um, we'd love to have the radiant heat. We'd love to, you know, pursue all these other issues that people are bringing up, and we need to let people have a voice. And uh, Mr. Kaling, do you wish to add anything? No, I agree 100%. In there's been a lot of people here putting a lot of thought uh, into this, taking time out of the day to come here. Frustration is what I'm hearing. Uh, and we, we know that Andy's going to come in front of us tonight. And I don't have a crystal ball. And the thing is that we have to work with reality. And what we have to do to give students an education may not be the best facility for them. But it will be a nice facility. And the thing is that <clears throat> we have to work for what we have. And we want to, I've been reaching out to people in the public sector uh, to see if there's any uh, opportunities that we're missing in regards to funding. 
Uh, nobody's properly answered for me yet. But <clears throat> I've talked to bankers. I've talked to different uh, people that are in the industry. And it's not that the trustees are sitting back behind the scenes doing nothing. We're working as well as you are to try and make this project happen. It's, uh, it's frustrating. And, and I hear everybody's voice here. And, but as Andy said and Joe said, we need to work through it for the best we can. And that's what I'd like to see. Maybe that's what you would like. I would all like to see them, definitely. You know? um, but the, the things down in the future, I mean, I went to school here, most, a lot of us have. And, um, you know, we, we put up with these buildings over here, these shop buildings that are, you know, ancient and need, need to be replaced as well. So it's not always about just, you know, we know that we have a budget, but, you know, if something is, you know, we'd like the wood cross-laminated, we'd like the radiant heat, we'd like the wood pellet boilers. I know that the state, I've just been texting back and forth, they have got money available for, to, to help with the, the heating and if the building is built out of wood. So those are things, you know, as far as the dollar amount, I don't know that anymore. And I know that Sean Mahoney was supposed to be here today, Got a kid home sick, so you know it's just um, you know, I, I I hate to see him cut the corners, and I know that we don't have the money to build what we really want to build. Thirteen so. years ago, we had approval from SBA to build a brand new building here. The mayor at that time said 20% of the children from Northampton come here. We are not going to sign off on it, and. We had it all done. We had the numbers. We had it worked out. The difference of what we would have had to pay at that time was very minimal. The mayor said no. And it went away. Yeah. So I, it's not like we haven't been oh, I, I know. previously. I know. Build a house 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and see what it is today. Right. You know, I don't know how anybody can even afford to build a house. You know, right. with the cost of labor and material, no matter what you get. I mean, you can't hire anybody to, to if, let, if you let them get them to come to work. Mm -hmm. that, that's a project there. So it's, it's a tough nut to crack, there's no doubt about it. And I'm not, I'm not in your shoes. I no, no, I hear my you. Own. No, I'm, we're all together. In yeah. This. But just a thought on the, on the radiant. That's very inexpensive if you put the tube in, in the slab. <laughs> the boiler can be added at any time later. Maybe through donations or who knows what, but for a minimal cost, you get the tube and put in the slab. You can do it as bit as an add alternate or whatever, but get it in there. It's there, and then down the road, who knows? You can add a boiler and you'll have it. We were something I agree that yeah, that we're going to get it in there and then, like I said, yeah. we'll come up with it. We're going to look at all these issues and hopefully we can incorporate some of them and get some of this funding that Mr. US Forest Roberts yes. and Mr. Parrott are, are talking about. Right. But we need to get through this yeah. to start moving yeah. forward. That's the bottom line, yeah. people. We well, can we sign, got a deadline. Yeah, when you sign on that line, is it going to be etched in stone or are these options like Jimmy's talking about going to still be there as far as the heating system? You know, to go with the pellets and put the radiant heat in, you know? We don't we don't want to miss out on that. No, agreed. We don't want to miss out on any of this. And, <clears throat> and, and the one, the radiant heat, in my opinion, is an easy one. All yeah. right? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Plan for it. Yeah. Plan for these other potential add-ons down the road. And, and have, have the systems able to, to receive them. We have to be forward-thinking. Yeah. I, I also think... You know, maybe I'm wrong, but this committee, in my mind, was always a recommendation committee to the board. That we're recommending things that we want. We're not necessarily the deciders that said the building is going to be built this way. And I think maybe we have to keep that in mind. If there are things that we want to recommend that are within cost, that would be recommendations that we would bring, that we would vote on, or we would bring forward as a committee to you guys. But. No, that's not great necessarily point, anything Joe. is, no, is that's spot decided on. at this table on what's in or out of a building. But if, yes, the cost does matter. But if we're, we're looking to recommend this, this system or that system or this building, I thought, you know, that's always been 
the end of the day, I want a, a, a facility that is able to educate students, that is going to last, uh, and you know that's what I'm looking for, and with the, the the least amount of disruption to the educational process for the students as possible. Uh, so when I sit here, that's my primary focus uh, around that, and making sure that. But I do at the end of the day. I think that just want to remind. I, I've always looked at maybe I was wrong. This is a recommendation committee on things, but not the final deciders on on things. I would totally agree with that. Correct. Those comments, Joe. And, and have we are having spirited conversation and recommendations, and let the voices be heard, and let's get this shaken out because bottom line is the board of trustees are going to be the deciding factor. And keep in mind, this is schematic design, so you have opportunities to change, improve, and massage this as we get into the next phase. And I think that's what SMMA really needs approval to do, is to start that next phase and start to work out some of these questions. How long would it take to vet a rebuild of the existing footprint to confirm that it's $7 million to rebuild that? To have it all centralized, to have the most coverage, because you're going to have children in two distinct building areas now. And so there's going to be safety issues. There's, the teachers are going to be pulled across to that. That it's, it's no longer a, a, a singular sort of learning location. So we have two Forge Horticulture buildings now, separate. That's kind of what the animal science is right now. Mm -hmm. They actually have three, four, so it Fair. works out. We're a campus, people are used to it. I hear you, I do, but just, I'm still pretty taken back that, that to rebuild the 5,000 square feet of burnt area is, is gonna cost more than $6 million. John, it's attached to the existing. We're doing environmental testing on that site so that we know what Fair. those conditions are. So we, we will look at that building and look at what the It sounds to me like the vote's going to happen this evening about whether it's going to be a, a steel building <coughs> and the, I don't see a proposal at all for rebuilding the existing building. The, the $1.1 million for site work doesn't have to happen. That's a, someone could be a millionaire if they just had that money in their pocket. There will be some site work. Let's not confused because there will be Northampton requirements to bring up the, up the grade, so it's not going to be a freebie, but there's something if the trustees wanted to look at, we certainly could. Right now, we haven't been given authority to do that. It would be considerably less, <laughs> considerably less site work, no stormwater management, if, if, the, if it happened as a rebuild. What we had there prior to the fire was insufficient for our program. True. It was too small of an area, so to expand on that spot would be infringing on the other area in the back and animal science and all of that. But it would be to turn the existing parking footprint into classroom footprint. Because you lost a classroom, an office space, and parking area. But that footprint that would require outside parking, which is happening now, you would still have an inside shop it's the two bays that are there now you still have the greenhouse and the existing classroom bathroom head house those would have to be brought to code which is feels like an appropriate thing to do and then rebuild the classroom office and then change the parking area into classroom space same footprint but we would be losing all the storage space that we need because mm -hmm. yeah. if you put a classroom in the barn space we are now down the shop space that we were getting in the new building as well as the garage space, it's not going to be the same as what we're trying to get. And then my only concern is we've talked about if we're going to have to do any site work there, are we now disturbing the soil that we have to test and maybe take out all the contaminated soil, which is a cost we're trying to avoid. That's, a, that's another concern that I have it if we are going to, to do that. To the education at that point. And then, then there's that as well. I mean, it, again, I don't know if, if we have to take care of the soil at that point, if we're going to rebuild on that spot, because we're going to have to, that foundation is going to have to be ripped out and redone. I would assume. Somewhere. Yeah. 
Correct. Did you say you're actively obtaining samples for testing? We will. In the next two to three weeks, we'll have testing done. We'll know what the risk is, if there is a risk. If there's nothing there, then there's a different discussion, but there's a good likelihood there is something in or around the facility. Which will all have to get mitigated if it gets demoed. Or, or potentially less of it if it doesn't. Too early to say, generally, but it's possible. Okay, time to move on. So what we have up on screen um, is yeah. just some visuals from other prefabricated metal buildings uh, to give you a sense of just what the exterior appearance could be. Uh, this is not too dissimilar from what we were thinking of initially as one of the options for uh, the exterior of the building. Um, this is a, a red uh, vertical metal siding um, product. Um, the actual panel that we'd be looking at, or that we have the cost estimates based on at least, um, is an insulated metal panel that you see in the bottom right hand corner. Um, it is a little bit more efficient, it is a little bit more durable than having uh, the insulation sort of a, a bag form on the inside of the building, which would require us to be building some type of uh, interior finish walls. So there was some cost efficiency that was there. And then the upper right hand corner, you see an example of what the ceiling finish may be in the shop spaces where there is exposed structure. Um, the classrooms would still have a drop ceiling similar to this, a modern version of this um, from an acoustic standpoint. What's the maintenance cycle on something like that? Is there, it's as long very, as everything works, it's not going to have issues around rot or uh, rust, I should say, but... Yeah, no, it, it is, it's designed for longevity. I, I believe that these are uh, referred to as the linear system, so there's <coughs> insulation that's laid directly on top of that fabric membrane that stretches across. Um, they actually use that as fall protection when they're erecting it, so there's it's, it's taut and it has a strength to it, and so it's not something flimsy that goes in. So they, they fill it from the top, actually, in terms of insulation, and then purlins go across, and then there's another layer of insulation that goes across the top of that. So it is insulated, it's designed for longevity. Um, it's, it's probably not a necessarily the 50-year building that we would hope for or to typically design for. It's probably more of a 20, 25-year building. Um, just in terms of what the prefab metal building um, is intended for, um, but it is it is something that we have used on school projects before. What does that actually mean to, in the industry? A 25-year lifespan? Is that what does that mean? Yeah. So it, I don't think it means that you're replacing the entire building at 25 years. I think it's that there's going to be maintenance that you need to um, consider um, exactly what that is over the course of that duration. I don't know. The answer to that question, we can certainly talk with the manufacturers and get a better understanding of what that is. How about if you had to go about replacing a panel, say it was damaged or something? Would that be quite an extensive process? Just like, I mean, a, like a whole exterior face just being torn apart just to replace one panel? Or so there, you probably have to remove a certain number of panels yeah. to get to the point where you can. Because I'm looking it. at that lock and groove system, it's like you yeah. put one thing together and then you take the rest of it apart just to. Yeah. I'll place one part there, so. Well, I got a metal building for my office and my shop's 35 years old, still standing, <laughs> hasn't fallen. Yeah. The only thing is, my overhead doors have faded in color, but the building still looks just good. My roof is still good. Knock on wood now, it's not going to probably have a leak, but um, anybody who wants to see it, you can come on up and look at it. it serves us well. I imagine you can perform regular maintenance on the building, and so if it needs... We haven't done anything to it. <laughs> okay. Except the inside. You know, but the other building is still standing. So it's, it, it's not what it sounds like when they say it's a 25 no. Right. No. Something. <laughs> we worked on the doors. But the building itself isn't... <laughs> Is in the life expectancy of 25 yeah, built okay. the metal frame. The so the I didn't say so, but it just. Yeah, no, great question. We, re we, we repaired the overhead doors, some of the side doors, but other than that, the main structure is fine. We haven't touched the roof in all those years. How about your window system? Still good? Still there? Well, I have one that's probably 50 years old and it's still standing. I can't say that there isn't 
some issues with it, but <laughs> it was a John Hancock building where they used to package eggs in over in, in West Hampton. Do you remember that, Jimmy? Yep. Yep. That's my sound. But there's also wooden buildings in Hatfield that are three years. Oh yeah. Look at the tobacco barns. How old they are? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So as part of the plan redesign, um, again, getting back to the, the design intent is making sure that we're still, um, A, being um, transparent in terms of what the revised vision of the building was going to be. Um, we updated the renderings that we produced uh, for the building, and hopefully these give you a good sense of uh, what the look and feel is. If you think that this is still um, an attractive looking building, a building that really um, uh, signals that the horticultural program is something that the campus takes pride in. Um, and we've done two different perspectives and two different versions um, of these renderings. One, um, sort of viewing the service yard um, here. Uh, the next slide actually shows what that future expansion could look like um, if the greenhouse and the uh, horticulture shop and the classroom were added. Um, I will say one of the benefits of this actually is you can imagine rounding the corner of the building because the service yard is there um, in, in sort of the foreground and then the greenhouse is in the background. It's not like the greenhouse is obstructing that view. So it actually makes, I think, access around um, and use of the service yard um, a little bit um, more ready than uh, the, the prior layout of this configured. And then if you advance, we have some views of the building as well from across the football field. And again, with the, the expansion to it there. So um, not not qualitatively different than um, where we had started from or what we were previously suggesting in overall that example. I have a question. What is the elevation in the in the floor inside between the classroom and the shop? So, I'm trying to think what that off the top of my head where it would be. It's probably in the three to four feet range in terms of what that rendering was um, conveying. And what's there for a petition between the two to keep the odor from from the shop from going into the classroom? I mean, there's going to be doors that are going to be open there, definitely. And if there's smoke in there, is it going to not go into the classroom? So I think there's, there's two things there. There's an exhaust system that is built into the shops uh, that would prevent that. Um, and then we also have the opportunity to look at um, how the systems are pressurized um, between the <coughs> classrooms um, so that the shop spaces would be under negative pressure versus the classrooms. So the, the potential of odors sort of migrating towards the classrooms would be mitigated. Can we prevent it entirely? It's probably challenging, but uh, there are HVAC system solutions to try to alleviate that. And is it a fireproof wall between the two? I don't think it's required to be. Um, we'll get into that as part of the code analysis as the next steps. Um, we've just had to view the construction type primarily up front um, in terms of allowing us to at least consider the fact that the lightning frame would be viable, but we haven't necessarily got to this stage of looking at the fire rate of separation. Typically in, in a fully sprinkler building, um, we don't need to create fire rate separations between a shop and a classroom space. It's really important. I know that I've seen some explosions that happen in buildings from tire inflation and oxygen settling tanks and stuff like that. So it's, very concerning what the, what the wall is going to be between the two, right. and whether it's for, for noise, for explosion, for fire, <coughs> things like that. So we'd be looking at, at uh, hazardous materials, especially um, storage capacities and locations as part of it. That's something that we would review with the building inspector as well as yes. we um, advance the design. Speaking of which, I, I did see the building inspector here, the, the, charge of the, the city's charging the city $80,000. That's not set in stone. Okay. I, I'd I, like to see that way. I planted that seed a okay. couple months ago with the mayor. That's a bunch of crap. <laughs> Good right here when you're all dark. <laughs> That's me, Mike. <laughs> What you're going to see up on the screen now is about a six and a half minute video. I think we talked about this at the last building committee meeting. Uh, so the SMMA, they sort of had the practice to, to have short videos of, of other projects. Uh, they obviously do that for marketing purposes. 
Uh, but knowing that we're very tight on the money uh, and, and not knowing what's out there for potential fundraising efforts, uh, as have made proposed that we create this video sort of um, killing two birds with one stone per se. Um, and I, I do want to thank SMMA. I do want to thank their, uh, their videographer. I personally feel that he did a, a wonderful job filming that day, editing, creating a story. Uh, and we wanted to have the building committee sort of preview it this evening. I'm going to show it to the board this evening at their meeting. And, uh, and then after today, it's, it's free game. Okay, so we'll be pushing it out through social media. Uh, getting on the website. Uh, I know I'm talking to Crystal, the business administrator, we've been looking at some more streamlined way of uh, accepting online donations. And once we have that up and running, you know, we'll work with SMMA to get sort of the link on the video, uh, you know, a little bit one-stop shop rather than watch his video and get to go someplace else to donate money. So uh, we're working on that still. But without further ado, if you, if you have six and a half minutes to watch this video, it'd be great. Turn off. I've got to find the <laughs> <laughs> was working very well earlier. <laughs> it worked last week. traditional schools all my career as a school counselor as an administrator when I came to Smith I felt a connection uh, the students that we serve here a lot of them are struggling the low income perhaps with special ed whatever the background I hear story after story after story from families that their child didn't like school growing up and then they came to Smith vocational and all they want to do is talk about school you know there's that, that direct connection between the academic in that vocational hands-on experience. When they graduate, they go back to the local communities, that cycle of life almost. Uh, that's my why. It is seeing the, the eyes open up and that engagement and that smile, and then seeing that they become productive citizens. I, I, I love it, I truly do. Hooker. I'm the superintendent here at Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School. In fact, we're the oldest vocational school here in the state, and we're the oldest agricultural school in the country. So we have a lot of history, uh, dating back to 1908. Our mission, we serve about 50 to 60 different communities here in Western and Central Mass. There's only four ag schools in the state, so students will be on a bus for about an hour, hour and a half each way to come here. If you want to have a future in animal science or agriculture, you're coming here. The interesting thing about horticulture is that there's many concentrations within that one particular field. So we're actually standing inside the greenhouse, uh, so we're able to uh, teach our students around greenhouse management, teach them about hydroponics and, and aquaponics. Hydroponics is growing plants in water without soil. We raise lettuce, tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, cilantro, basil, stuff like that. And then we have a regular greenhouse that we grow plants in, or we propagate and grow them in soil, and uh, we use those for our plant sale with the FFA in the springtime. We also have uh, what a lot of our students and staff call our forestry program. That forestry is actually part of horticulture. So our students are able to learn arboriculture skills, uh, which is very popular when it comes to the industry in Western Mass. We know we have a lot of forest uh, areas. So yeah, how do we manage those forests? Our students learn that. We climb trees, we prune trees, we plant, maintain trees. So this is work that they would do at people's houses, cities, parks. We don't have a lift truck. So we climb with ropes and saddles. We learned the knots on our own to climb, so like right now we're just practicing. It's not just climbing trees. This is a fraction of what we do. In addition to that, they're exposed to large equipment. We have some tractors, we have some heavy equipment like skid steers, backhoe, front end loaders, excavators. The students learn to operate, maintain. They're able to get their hoisters license, their commercial driver's license, and their pesticide license. Uh, we also have the opportunity to give a culinary program. 
So where do all of our salad greens go uh, once they're harvested? They go to culinary. So then our culinary students are able to then learn how to prepare those from the farm to the table. So we truly have a farm to table initiative. Stuff like that that is used in the culinary department as well as the cafeteria? So it's one particular program that offers so many different avenues for our students. Unfortunately, a couple of years ago, we had a devastating fire and we lost the, the majority of this particular building. We did have part of the building burned down and we lost quite a bit of equipment. One of the spaces of the building that we lost was a classroom. So there's no dedicated classroom anymore. And I think it impacts the, the program long term. That's been the biggest challenge. Our students actually went up to the instructors after the fire and said, don't worry, we're going to be okay. We've had this vision uh, in expanding our agriculture program here on campus. So having that new building, it would mean everything uh, for our staff and our, our students. More current classrooms. Place for the simulators, like I was saying, that'd be pretty cool. Like, maybe a place for the greenhouse next to it. I would love a rock climbing wall. When it's snowing out or it's 20 degrees below zero, there's no climbing trees. Maybe a decent sized garage for our equipment so not uh, open. So we're hoping to have more of a, a year-round experience for our students that way as well. Our governance model is quite unique. We're the only independent vocational school in the state. Most schools, are they belong to a local city or town, or there's a regional agreement that sort of oversees the governance of that particular school. We really don't have any of that. So the challenge is how do we raise enough money to build the building that our students deserve? But where does the money come from? That's the challenge. Hopefully senior year we'll have our new building. I did my mom's walkway with bricklaying that way from here, Mr. Nevin's bones. He's a really good teacher. He's funny, he jokes around, he's not too straight. All right. <laughs> we have very strong partnerships with local employers and local municipalities. We have very strong, rigorous academics for those students who want to go off to college. No matter what students want to do upon graduation, our job here at Smith is to open that door. By doing what we do, we train them to be able to be very skilled and master these skills that they would need in industry, so it gives them that leg up. And also a lot of companies are looking for two, three years of work experience when they're hiring people, and our students have that when they leave because they're doing all of that here. I like to see our youth succeed. The aha moment of a student when the light bulb goes off and they understand something that they've been working hard at, struggling to get, all of a sudden they get it and they're like, wow, this is awesome. Seeing that one person succeed is what makes me come back every day. Well done. That's very good. I hope Andy's not looking for a promotion or a raise now. <laughs> nice job. Well, let's put it to use. Yep, that was well done. Development, pricing for design development, um, and another moment where we take stock and see how we are budget wise. Um, and with approval of the we would be to see these um, be looking towards um, March for bidding. So we will have some filed sub bids here um, that will have to be bid first, uh, after which um, general contract could be uh, obtained, be bid. We are looking at June of 2025. Which again is our, our deadline when it comes to the grant money. Uh, we have to spend it by June of 25. So we're, we are sort of up against it. Uh, you know, that would be my, my discussion with the board this evening is uh, not to decide on what kind of building. It is more of uh, where are we at this point? You know, are we comfortable as a board to move into DB? Uh, which would allow SMMA to have basically according to the schedule the month of December uh, going into January 
uh, to, to finalize that phase, have the official approval of DD. Um, and obviously, I think there's a great discussion today that we have to sort of review that all go into that phase. Uh, if we delay, honestly, much longer, um, you know, it's been, what, a year and a half, uh, that we're not going to be finalizing the project by June 25, and then we have some bigger issues to deal with, which is the money. Um, so I, I do feel, and I've been saying this from day one, basically, you know, we are up against it. You know, we are at the full power to, to make some decisions. Uh, decisions not necessarily on the, the, the nuts and bolts of the particular building, but we need to have decisions moving forward as far as, you know, are we okay with this budget, you know, um, so we can, you know, continue to move on. Uh, that's where my gray hair and my, my stress level has been over the last several months. Well, the only way you're going to know what it actually costs is design it and get it out there. Correct. <laughs> and, and then develop yourself a list of alternates. Okay, if you come in under, what's your first alternate? What's the first thing? Because the state is going to make you take number one, two, three, four, it five. It has to go in order. Right, in order. So start thinking about that. What's our dream list? What's our alternate list? And think about what's a priority and get right. that. And if it comes in 100 or 200 or 300,000 under, you might have something to play with. So. The only way you're going to know what it really costs, all we're looking at is hypotheticals. We're looking at a database. We're looking what we think. We can't think anymore. Yeah, you no, got to pull the plug and go. Certainly question $120,000 a month of general conditions. Yeah, I so feel we'll know, we'll know what it comes if I work that way. Yeah. <clears throat> hey, but it depends what they're putting in the general conditions. Here's what well, you would put in your construction. It's still, it's still, it's still all, all the same. It's all the same. It's it's the stuff that you need to run the job, and the, the supervision, the management, the the you know the toilets, the fence, you know all that sort of stuff. Right. So the let's power. Get it put it up a bit, and then we'll know where we're at. Right. I, can I ask? You, sorry, before is the design at this phase so specific that you're making a decision between the metal prefab and timber or stick? Well, I think that's a decision the committee needs to make because you're only 100000 off. You know, when you look at that budget, so now that's your next decision. Do we want to go with metal or do we want to stay with wood? And I think that that's what the whole committee's got to think about because that 100000 somehow is going to get absorbed in there somehow. You know, and that, that's all it was. Yeah, like the generator, that's 50000 on <coughs> the generator, too. I mean, no, that's, I think, way inflated. <coughs> There's going to be a lot of little nuts and bolts there probably to tweak around. Good luck. So I think the big thing is, yeah, you can decide on wood or metal. Because they're going to need that direction. At the life answer point, Jim, I 1,000% agree. I'll be, that's, that will be my, rec my recommendation to the board this evening. And back to Jonathan, one of your comments earlier, um, I fully support. I There was no way in good conscience I could stand in front of the board and say let's move to DD when the estimate was 10 to 12 million dollars. Uh, I, I think that would just be totally inappropriate. So I think that's been sort of the, the charge that we've had as a committee over the last few months and uh, you know meeting weekly. How do we go from that 10 to 12 million down to I think we're now within the ballpark and I think it's a small park, ballpark, like a little league ballpark at this point. Um, you know we're that close to the six million dollar budget. Now I do feel more comfortable asking the board, you know, for approval to move to DD. So then some of these very fine-tuned details we can, you know, those, those are the hard decisions that we have to make, but allow us to make those now for the next couple of months. I don't think we were at that, that point a couple of months ago when we were looking at an initial estimate of 10 to 12 million. So. We're going to take the money out of the bank, guys. We're going to start spending it. And we've done a hell of a job holding on to it since the fire from the, 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 the money the citizens of of the city of North Ham gave us out of their pockets. And the construction guys who dropped off shovels and they just rolled out the, the, the you know the red carpet to us and said, what can we do? And we've been holding on to that since the great job that was done by Joe and Melanie on getting those grants. We've been hoarding that. Now we gotta spend it. We're gonna get it rolling and we're gonna start doing it in like I said, I'm only one guy in the trusteeship, but I'm, I'm going to kick it in the ass tonight at the meeting and see what we can do. I'm going to recommend, I don't know if it's my place, but I'm going to recommend we go with wood because I think we'll have more bidders than we will with metal. I like metal, 
but that's going to limit the amount of general contractors in the close proximity that would bid that, where wood is going to open up the door. And for a $100,000 difference, and again, what we're playing here, I'm going to recommend we go with wood. That's just my thought. I have a question before we convene um, matter, Helen. On the SD estimate <coughs> value engineering sheet, let's call it page seven, I think. The middle column, 11 slash 08 estimate would reduce square foot. Mm -hmm. Does that include the, the future expansion in greenhouse, or is that less that up? No, that the middle column represents still a CLT construction at the reduced square footage. Okay. Of 70. All right. So then, then the six point seven eight is is the reduced square foot with uh, without the greenhouse and the future expansion. What would the future expansion cost? Do, do we have an idea? <coughs> Those numbers. I mean, we could just do simple square foot. Right. So uh, that's a great question. Uh, we could do simple square foot for the difference between the seventy nine hundred and the ten thousand, and then we did have a cost for a, a new greenhouse in we'll an earlier estimate. estimate. Well, I'd like to know what that may be. Okay, mm -hmm. round numbers. Mm -hmm. Maybe in the next couple of days, yep. possible. Okay. Yeah. An estimate comes out to be like four hundred and thirty-five dollars a square foot for the vertical construction. So, I mean, that that might be a tell right there what it could be. Do Do we want to have a, rec, a, re, a vote or a recommendation for Andy to be able to present if the board does move forward on D and D tonight? Because we're not going to reconvene again. Do we want to make a recommendation on metal versus wood? And in the expansion, I'm sure metal is going to continue to go up. Does wood inflate at the same rate? So we, saw we did a, weird, we did a weird, right, we saw a weird flip, but I mean, if we did a wood expansion later, it's back to normal. Would it potentially right be now. cheaper than a metal expansion later? We're seeing things stabilize a little bit. It's hard to say a year from now, but. It's a commodity, so it's really hard to say. I think a vote would be good to if so Andy's not going to stand there and get the sword thrown at him without some backup. So um, I think Mr. Moran's suggestion and, and Mr. Roberts somewhat seconding it. Um, yes, that's what we were gathered here to do is present a recommendation to move forward in some way. We don't have all the nuts and bolts in order, but uh, I guess the big picture question is metal framed or wood framed? Is, is that the consensus? Committee members? Yes, I believe so. So, um, could I just ask SMMA, do you feel like we need to give you an answer? or? That we need to give a recommendation to the board to give a direction to give a recommendation for Great. Tom, you'd be given a recommendation for Superintendent Leakenhooker to, to to present to the board, but then the board's got to make a decision. Understood. So, but we let's mm -hmm. not say we went through this process for nothing. We got a lot, a lot of spirited conversation. Right. It's not and like him taking it there all by himself. Right, right. You know, he's got and, some and, then, and then, even no matter what, it can go different way. Yeah, I'm for wood. I, I make a motion for wood. Yeah, second. I'm for wood. Okay. All in favor of wood? Raise your hand. I'm abstaining at this point. Okay. That's, that's the majority. All right. So, James and I go metal. Do the committee speaks. Would you like? Really? Should we hear something about that? No, just okay. Both Jim and I, we sat here and we talked but briefly, and we were leaning towards the metal, not the wood. I'm just voicing that. Does yeah, that no? But it's, does it have any like pedagogical or functional things we should hear about, or were you just leaning towards metal? We would prefer the metal. Is what what I'm willing to say. Oh, this is interesting. <laughs> well, I, I think we also need to recognize that DCR and EPA have ponied up funds. They're not going to pay anything for metal, and they, they're likely to pay a, a considerable amount for wood. Maybe up to six hundred thousand. 
and that needs to get explored. Are you guys confident with those? Yes. I just had an email on it, or a text, yes. It's, it's going to take a little work, homework, which we can start on once we know we're going well, with the wood. There has to be a story. I think you've got to be fair. Yeah, there's I understand, a, there's, gentlemen. Yeah. Lenny just showed me. It was, it's, they can commit zero at this point. But based on what a decision is made, they're able to make an argument. It was still going to take a legislative and other actions. Correct? Yes. Money Perfect. aside, schedule will be reviewed too. Uh, there's a <coughs> time issue with both. So we would look at that and see what would match up with the schedule as well and let the committee know. All right, so so the voice is clear. The, the consensus of the committee is what? And if that's I like level, that's but I'm also thinking we're going to get better numbers on the wood because of more competitive bidding. That's yeah, the only way I'm going that way. And in the end, if we can get up to 600000 for, you know, That'll give us other options too. I'm just yeah. Yeah. Hold on. our preference yeah. for a couple of reasons is the metal, but we're not against wood at all. Why do you think that, Mr. Moran? What? Why you think you're going to get better bidding? I think you'll have more competition doing wood stick building than metal because forest just went out of business, closed up after 70 some odd years, so that eliminated one of our re good guys that will be bidding this. He just finished our yeah, the public thing. safety complex. That was all wood though, wasn't it? But, huh? Wasn't that all wood frame? Yeah, yeah, wood frame. But still, he's a metal builder. And he, and he has a metal, had a metal building franchise. Yeah, so I'm there's only sure two or one. three in the area where I think we got a dozen wood stick builders. That's the only reason I'm going that way. Yeah, but to the GC, such as, I'll just use the local one, D.A. Sullivan, can team up with a metal builder. So that's that, that's not eliminating the bidding environment in any means. I, 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 I tend to disagree with your comment actually. Okay. I think either way you'll get you'll get activity. We've had at least six local GCs share interest in the project, whether it's metal or wood, and have the ability to do both. So I think you'll see a good response either way. Question mm -hmm. question for you guys. Um, you said metal eliminates the need for pillars in the middle. Um, what is the stick wood going to do? So I think the structure is, is a slightly different concept. There's sort of load-bearing shear walls right. that are going to be running through the building. So it changes the design of the garage spaces. I wouldn't and say that necessarily. Yes, I think the walls that we have already in are in there are going to become load-bearing. You're going to have to right. carry them all the way up and create a load-bearing wall. So we could use laminated beams or something in order to not have to have pillars in the middle of the garages? I think we still have to, we shouldn't have pillars in the middle of the garage. There should be the ability to use joists, um, some type of longer span <coughs> element up above to be able to get clear span in the garage space. Okay. I think that's, I think that's a key requirement. That was your concern, Mark. My concern <laughs> is if we're having to do anything yeah. that will take away Square footage for use in the garages and the workspace. And stuff. Yeah, it okay. limits. Yeah, limits space and mobility within there. I wouldn't. I wouldn't be in favor of either. That, that's exactly what DCR is hoping to demonstrate: is that you can use wood in place of steel. Right. I, I just this just it, that came up. I just want to make sure that we're not. Good question. Hindering the space that we. The clear span. Correct. Yeah. The open space. Yeah. As we would get into the detailed design in the next phase, if there was anything that came up that would sort of be contrary to what we're talking about now, we would certainly come back and... But I think that's probably the DD discussion, you know, once we really get into the design. I guess my... I'm not hearing anybody opposed to me standing in front of the board this evening to, to push the board, ask for the board to vote uh, to move to DD. Is anybody said that you know, we want to stay in the SD phase because we have some bigger issues to, to deal with? Or are we okay with moving forward? I guess that's what I need right now and then I think we've just given you know, a recommendation mm -hmm. to the board a preference around the wood framing uh, but again that is an ultimate decision through I think DD we can make that decision ultimately uh, but are we close enough to the, the six million dollar budget have we totally drastically changed the design in a way that we want to start over or are we okay moving into DDA we're okay moving okay that's why I need to hear yeah yeah. Have you uh, been over to UMass to see the cross-laminated building over there? It's 
uh, it would be worth your while to you and the other instructors to mm -hmm. go over there and really take a look at it and you're going to get an idea of wow unbelievable yeah no I I, I just want to make sure that we're not going to lose space oh, that's, all. that's perfectly good a good question and yeah we don't want you to either want you you're yeah. gonna be happy or you want to won't work here yeah to, to be clear I'm giving the eye on, on wood with this floor plan, and I have no doubt that you'll be able to achieve this floor plan <coughs> okay. with wood. Okay, to adjourn one's this meeting. Okay. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.